Hi, my name is Trevor Hancock and I'm founder and president of Conversations for a One Planet Region. And this is our October 22nd session, part of our fall series on cultural evolution and shifting values. And today we're going to be talking about uh, valuing nature and some of the implications for that. So I am going to share my screen, which will just take a moment. And once I have this up and running, I will talk us through the opening part of this session. Now, unfortunately, this is a re-recording because I forgot to do the uh, recording of my part of this session. So I've re-recorded it. And because I haven't stitched the two together, you'll have to find the second part online accompanying this version. So first of all, let me say that as Conversations for One Planet Region, we acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen pe speaking peoples on whose ter traditional territory we meet. Um, this is the first, or the, really, of a series of three sessions on valuing nature. And it's based on a book by um, uh, Jeremy Lent uh, called The Patterning Instinct, in which he suggested there are three core value shifts we need uh, and they are valuing nature uh, a shift to valuing nature a shift to valuing community and cooperation and a shift to valuing quality of life and today our topic is valuing nature and so what we want to talk about is what it would mean for decision making if this was a core value and what are some of the implications for policy changes and local action so there are going to be three speakers, and I am the first of those speakers, talking about valuing uh, from an economic uh, and legal perspective. The second speaker will be Gertie Josh, and the third Shannon Waters, and they are both uh, on the second part of this video, which you'll have to access separately, as I said earlier. Gertie Josh is a, uh, um, a sister, and um, a, 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 will speak from a Catholic perspective, but more broadly about spiritual aspects of valuing nature. Shannon Waters is an indigenous public health physician uh, in the Cowichan region and uh, working in her home territory. And she will be speaking from the point of view of an indigenous perspective on what it means to be valuing nature. But as I said, I'm going to start, and in this session, I'm going to be talking about valuing nature through economic valuations and legal rights. So the first point to make is that from an economic approach to valuing nature, natural capital is one of several forms of capital that are beyond our traditional thinking about economic capital. So social capital, human capital and natural capital and the latter is our endowment as it says here in all of the resources that that we use but in a recent report on comprehensive wealth in canada from the international institute for sustainable development they suggested that there are actually two forms of natural capital there is what they called market natural assets which are really the things that we buy and sell and then there are uh, there's a form of capital in the form of Canada's key ecosystems, which are forests and wetlands and grasslands that really underpin our existence. And the really important point they make is that, uh, quoting Stiglitz, um, well-known economist who does a lot of work in this area, um, not all assets can or should be expressed in monetary terms. Some are critical to well-being and their monetary value is therefore not relevant because they are effectively priceless. And Stiglitz went on to say, ecosystems and the climate provide goods and services that are not readily replaced and therefore could be considered critical. So what they're really saying is we shouldn't put a monetary value on these critical ecosystem services that underpin our very existence. They cannot and should not be included, wrote the IISD in its report, should not be included in aggregate measures of comprehensive wealth. It would be a big mistake to put an economic value on them and raise the possibility they could be traded off for other forms of capital. So we don't want to, uh, to sell off 
the things that are essential to our well-being in order to make a profit next year. So that said, they also did then look at what they had called Canada's market natural assets, which is the things we do buy and sell. And they, they found that in real per capita terms, that is to say adjusted for inflation, um, they had declined in, in value uh, by 17% from 1980 to 2015 because of 15 of 19 of Canada's key natural resource assets being depleted. And that doesn't even include the commercial fisheries or water because they couldn't find adequate wet measures of those uh, for their report. So from an economic valuation point of view, yes, we should value nature to a point. There are aspects of nature that are truly priceless and we should not value. And um, what, even when we look at what we do value in, a, in economic or market terms, it's clearly clear that we are already depleting our natural capital. So that's one way to approach valuing nature. This is a second way to approach it, and that is to expand legal rights with respect to nature. And I want to talk about five different forms of legal rights. Two of them pertain to human rights, uh, our current right to a healthy environment and the rights of future generations to a healthy environment and to sustainable resources. And then three aspects of legal rights that deal with nature's rights. Nature is viewing nature as a person, considering the rights of other species, and thinking about uh, the fact that we may be perpetrating crimes against nature, which amount to ecocide. So the first is the right to a healthy environment, which David Boyd, who is currently the UN's special rapporteur on the right to a healthy environment and is a legal scholar uh, and consultant uh, living here in this region and, uh, and with appointments at UBC and UVic, uh, and has written, literally written the book on this about the rights of nature. Um, he found in his book in 2015 that this right to a healthy environment is explicitly included in the constitutions of 100 nations. It's incorporated in the national environmental laws of more than 100 countries. Um, and included in regional human rights treaties ratified by more than 120 nations. That's all good news. Now, of course, having the right doesn't mean that the right is ever fully implemented or expressed or enforced, but at least it's a start. And these are some of the countries which have it either in dark green with a protected right constitutionally to a healthy environment, uh, or at least with it uh, with constitutional provisions. And you will notice that certain countries don't have it, and they are largely, it must be said, Anglo-Saxon countries, which is interesting. So the USA, Canada, um, Denmark, uh, Britain, uh, New Zealand, but also notice uh, Malaysia, also notice uh, Japan. Um, so there are some obvious gaps in this. And in particular, of course, it doesn't exist here in Canada. That we do not have a right to a healthy environment in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. There is a campaign, the Blue Dot campaign of the David Suzuki Foundation, that is trying to get this into the Charter and has been doing so, first of all, by getting municipalities to recognize the right to a healthy environment and then try and roll that up to have provinces recognize it and ultimately Canada. But it needs to be there. We may, may be making a bit of progress. Um, so the Parliamentary Committee on Environment and Sustainable Development in 2017 recommended that the preamble of the Canadian Environmental Protection Act be amended to recognize a right to a healthy environment. Now notice this is not the constitution, this is just one act. Um, the government most recently has committed to uh, bringing in the, the preamble, bringing this in rather, but only as a preamble. Uh, and the problem with the preamble is it really doesn't have a lot of teeth. So it's, uh, again, it's a very minor step, but we're nowhere near valuing nature in these terms and valuing our own right to a healthy environment. Um, and so there is actually a petition to the House of Commons 
um, which was open for signing until the 20th of November, um, initiated by um, a couple of folks right here in British, in uh, Victoria, um, through our uh, the MP for Victoria, Laurel Collins. So there are small steps happening. The second human aspect of, the, of, of valuing nature from a legal perspective has to do with the notion of intergenerational rights, the rights of future generations to a healthy environment. And in 2015, the Welsh uh, Assembly brought in a Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, uh, which gives, uh, as they say, ambition, permission and legal obligation to improve our social, cultural, environmental and economic well-being. So notice this is actually more than just environmental, just valuing nature. It is a broad valuing of well-being. Um, and it actually requires public body in Wales to think about the long-term impact of their decisions. I think we need this kind of legislation right here in BC. And remember, Wales is roughly, this actually is a bit smaller than us, three and a half, four million, a bit smaller than BC's um, population. So this is a second approach to it. And they've created as a result, a future generations commissioner for Wales whose role is to be the guardian of future generations. Again, something we could do right here in BC. Um, and then there is the One Planet Council, which is an independent voluntary body that supports One Planet development in Wales. Again, something we need here in BC. So now let me talk about three different aspects of the rights of nature as opposed to the rights of people uh, in terms of valuing nature. So the first, is to actually see nature as a person. We recognize corporations as a person. Why wouldn't we recognize nature as a person? And New Zealand has actually done this. It's actually granted legal recognition as persons to both the Wanganui River and the Te Urawera region. Uh, which was previously a national park. And the act establishing Te Urawera states that it has all the rights, powers, duties, and liabilities of a legal person. And those rights are then exercised uh, and performed on its behalf by a board. Uh, and um, a follow-up in 2020 noted that legislatures, courts, and voters in a number of other countries have also declared that rivers and lakes and other living systems have legal rights. So there's some progress there, but again, not yet in Canada. We could be doing this in BC and certainly in Canada. A second aspect of valuing nature is valuing other species. The notion um, right now is that animals are property in the eyes of the law. So they're only valued at law and in terms of property. Although we do recognize the rights of other species to exist in things like the Species at Risk Act. And here in BC, we don't have a Species at Risk Act. Uh, it was part of the NDP's platform in 2016, and it was in the Environment Minister's mandate letter, but Premier Horgan reneged on that commitment in April 2019. So again, something we could do and should do, and in fact should have done already in BC, and it is shameful that this has not happened and shameful that the government went back on its commitment. Um, and in fact, not only uh, is this a matter of recognizing the need to protect other species as the Species at Risk Act does, but as David Boyd points out, in, in some countries courts have recognized that endangered species have the legal right to exist. Now, I'm not sure I'd extend that to the smallpox virus or perhaps the COVID virus right now, but the principle in general is a good one that we should be following up on. And then finally, I want to come to ecocide. Um, so there is a movement underway, uh, and you can find it online, to make ecocide a crime against peace at the UN and to bring it under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, to make the perpetration of an, of an environmental crime against humanity illegal and something that could be prosecuted, criminal in fact. Um, and so this is an organization called Ecocide Alert and there is an organization called Stop Ecocide which intends to make or try, is trying to make Ecocide an arrestable offense. 
Um, and there is a little bit of movement at the International Criminal Court, which did in 2016 announce a shift in focus toward assessing crimes that result in the destruction of the environment or of protected objects. So we are slowly getting there perhaps, but both economic and um, uh, legal valuations of nature are only one way to approach it. And so what we should be doing is, um, is moving to uh, look at other ways of valuing nature. And in the next video, our next two presenters, Gertie Josh and uh, Shannon Waters, We'll talk about this from the perspective of valuing nature in spiritual terms and valuing nature from the perspective of indigenous people. So thank you very much and I will now stop this.